Welcome to the Your Town Television Program. My name is Jeff Klein, your host for this NPS Foundation sponsored segment, where we take a look at interesting faculty and students and the interesting thing they're doing around the Monterey County area and in our nation. And in this segment, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, senior lecturer Doug Burton from the uh, Defense uh, Resource and Management Institute uh, to take a talk a little bit about him, his background, and what he's doing on campus. Doug, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me today, Jeff. Well, uh, before we jump into uh, Dermi and what you do for those and the courses that's offered by that interesting institute, let's talk a little bit about you. You represent um, uh, many of us on campus, about a third of us on campus, uh, for our faculty that have military or uh, backgrounds. Uh, and have also been educated in the fields that we're uh, uh, doing. So let's say, uh, let's talk about you. You were in the Navy. Mm -hmm. What, uh, where were you reared and what motivated you to join the Navy? Well, I'll tell you, I, I have a somewhat long story about where I was reared, uh, what, but I must include props if you'll allow me to do that. Well, now, does, this, does this involve a sheriff of some sort? This does not involve a sheriff <laughs> or, okay. or anything like that. Sure. But, but please, I think it's, uh, I think All it's right. part of it. What are you going to show us? So I was, uh, was born and spent 18 years in Mansfield, Ohio. Okay. And anyone that's from Mansfield, Ohio, well, let's say 99.9% .9 of people that are from Mansfield, Ohio, right. happen to be fans of the Cleveland Browns. Oh, I see. Are they a football team then? <laughs> yes, they are. They, and that's a very are they fair... Are National League? <laughs> <laughs> that's a fair question, especially yeah. because my team went 0-16 last year. Yes, a perfect record. It's a perfect record <laughs> in the opposite direction. <laughs> this uh, probably... Um, I, I guess it would capture the essence of who I am and how I came out of Mansfield, Ohio, in that if you come from that area of the country, you become very dedicated to right. things like teams and the group and the family. And you're reliably consistent, right? Reliably, you're loyal. reliably consistent, <laughs> even through those very rough times. So right. being, being raised in Ohio, I am a Browns fan. We have high hopes for them in yes. the upcoming seasons with some of the moves they've made lately. But um, um, the second piece I want to talk about right. are my mom and dad. Great. And knowing that they were forever Cleveland Browns fans would give you that little bit to tell you how consistent and steadfast they were sure. in their values and things like that. My Which mom, is a strong Midwestern trait. Strong Midwestern trait. So right. um, hopefully this helmet um, <laughs> exemplifies that. <laughs> Great. Um, the third piece that I have to talk about, of course, even though, even though I didn't join the Navy until I was 18, sworn in in Ohio, um, is I think it's important um, that I put this up in some <laughs> okay. in some there way we we can to, show it right there, to right? like say these I, I consider these to be maybe the two most important pieces of who of, of kind of who I am and Navy where history. I where I came from okay. and even though this is a Navy history book yep, this is just to represent the Navy right. in general okay. I grew up in a family um, that was for the most part Navy centric at least in my house my dad was a machinist mate in the U.S. Navy back in the Korean War right, days. Right. So hearing the stories that he talked about and the way he and my mom talked about it and their separations and what they went through, that all was part of me being born and raised in Mansfield, Ohio and, and kind of the path to how uh, the Navy became so important to me. Great, and so you enlisted at 18? I, I did, I ended up enlisting, but I didn't have a traditional enlistment where I didn't go to boot camp. Uh oh! I went to a place called the Naval, um, uh, the Naval Academy Preparatory School oh, I in see. Rhode Island. So that's the oh to get a couple years before you actually jumped in to sure. get to get one year. Okay, um, you spend one year there, and it's and it's for those that uh, maybe uh, didn't make make a cut to get into the Naval Academy the first time, or need to dust off the calculus, or, or needed to yeah. dust off some things. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I got to go to, to the uh, preparatory school in Rhode Island. Well, now, there's not Korea. a lot of people actually understand that that is what the Navy offers that as an opportunity to high school students who may not get that first appointment, but you can go to the preparatory school, you can you continue with your classes, uh, you, you better compete to get into the academy, and uh, many times until someone actually applies and isn't accepted, do they ever learn about that opportunity? Yeah. So that's great that you got a chance to do that. Yeah, it's absolutely correct. So I was an E1 and then an E2 at the prep school. 
And then you made it into the academy. I did, of course. If you successfully navigate to the preparatory school, then you do get your you do get the chance to go and uh, and and bump your head against even harder academics at the Naval Academy. So after Rhode Island, you went to Annapolis in Maryland. I did. And then you graduated. What did you do in the service? Yeah. So. Um, it, it's it's funny, as I was at, at the Naval Academy, I had no idea when I showed up what I wanted to do. Um, but I knew there was this dream at the time about some aircraft that would operate both as a helicopter in some sense and as a fixed wing aircraft. It was only in the exploratory phases back then. Right. And I knew, for some reason, I knew that I wanted to fly that. So I thought that the best way to do that would be to be an aerospace engineer. So I would understand most of the flight characteristics of whatever this new system sure. was going to be in the right. Navy. So I, I was an aero engineer, and that's what I graduated with from the academy to set me up for something that nowadays is known as the V-22. Right. It's a vertical takeoff uh, aircraft that can that tilts its... Uh, tilts the rotors forward so that it can fly as a, a regular airplane as well. Well, let's put this down right here yep. so, so we can continue to see it as we go on. That camera's got it. That's got good. It. So, But you didn't fly the V-22. I didn't fly the V-22. What did you fly? Um, as a matter of fact, I, I'm, I'm sad to report that the United States Navy does not have a single V-22 yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Marine Corps. <laughs> the United States Marine Corps is now deploying and flying those V-22s all over the place. So I was a little, I was a little off on my timing vector when it, when it comes service. to flying. Yes, <laughs> but, I, but I did, so I went to flight school because right. I wanted to fly the V-22. And I knew that the helicopter guys were going to get first crack at the V-22 when it joined the fleet because they, they still thought right. it was going to actually join the fleet. So I became a helicopter pilot. Great. And what type of helicopter? I, I initially flew something called the SH-2F Sea Sprite. Oh my goodness! I didn't know you were that old. It's yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was on. It was on. It was in its final few years. Okay. And then right. I transitioned into um, the H-60 Seahawk, which is the Navy's version of a Black Hawk. And and we would not in the Navy. We would never call something a Black Hawk. We had yeah, to change it to, sea to the Seahawk. And yes. it was really the. It is still the workhorse of the helicopter community. Uh, at the in the fleet, from hunting submarines to shifting supplies to doing all the vertical lift that we need done. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, what were some of the more interesting uh, things that happened to you during your career? Yeah. So, so the flying. So, I, I like to think of my career in like two big chunks. And the first chunk would be my tactical piece, which was the flying piece. Right. So, um, uh, I would. I, I think it would be interesting to share just a blip. Uh, blip from that. Sure. Where I was on, and the aircraft that I Wait, flew. You don't have a helicopter down Yeah, I wish I did have a helicopter. You was know what Admiral Ellis was on? He brought submarines. I was actually <laughs> going to bring a helicopter yeah. so I could sit it right here, but I had a Black Hawk. Uh, oh, a model no, Black would, Hawk. Oh, and you I, wouldn't live that down. Yeah, I couldn't. I would not have been able to get past yeah. that. Um, but, but, uh, one thing that happened since this, the aircraft, the helicopter that I flew, we deployed on frigates, cruisers, and destroyers, which you are very right. familiar with, I having am. been the CEO of uh, a destroyer in your time. But we were those uh, pain in the neck aviators that went along with the smaller combatants mm -hmm. um, on all of their deployments. And on one of these deployments, we were augmenting the force down in the Caribbean to, to, to search for, locate, find, intercept, intercept uh, <laughs> drug runners, drug runners yes. down in the Caribbean. And right. we actually, I was on, on a mission, and lo and behold, the intel held true for a day. And it was, uh, sometimes it's not always uh, quite right because right. the other guys are thinking about what they're doing. But lo and behold, there was this go-fast boat mm -hmm. sprinting towards... Um, Sprinting towards Jamaica. So a go-fast is a, is a multi-engine, high-speed uh, boat, usually carrying cocaine, yes. uh, into the southeast United States. Yes, okay? and there it was. And so we stayed away from it so that we could go back and refuel, relaunch, have the ship get closer. Right. And we were able to stop this guy. Uh, capture him. It was interesting that, the, that we had a makeshift jail on the frigate. Right, I was on the USS right. Boone at the time, so uh -huh. we had a makeshift jail. So it was kind of exciting for a while, and we uh, pulled in almost 400 pounds of cocaine, as you as you mentioned. Yep. That uh, you know, like that pure, the very purest. So kind. what was the second uh, section that you wanted to talk about? You, one was flying on that yeah. one. What was the other uh, story? Yeah, so the second section leads me to probably why I'm here with you today, and that's um, the operations research piece. Or right. I like to think of myself as an analyst. 
Well, now you're a graduate of MPS. And, you, yes, you I am. Through, through operations research. And so now you did a lot with that in the Navy. So tell us about that. Yes. So, so once the Navy um, had decided that uh, tactically I had served my purpose, <laughs> then in its great wisdom, and I think, it, I think this is wisdom, I'm not being sarcastic at all. Right. In great wisdom, after I graduated from the Naval Postgraduate School, had my operations research degree, every job that I had past my flying jobs was something connected to, in my opinion, analysis. Because I thought every job that I did in the Navy had analytical aspects well, that, I could, yes. that I could make better decisions with. And that's what it, really what it was all about. But I was assigned specific jobs to be an analyst, several of them after the Navy. So I spent that second large chunk of my career in the Navy being what I like to think of as an operations research practitioner or an analyst or whatever you would want to call it. Well. Uh, Let's go from there to actually how we captured you at MPS, and tell us a little bit about the uh, Defense Resource Management Institute, DERMI, and how being an operations practitioner fits in with that school. Yes. Um, Defense Resources Management there, Institute. There were Defense Resources Management Institute. Yes. Okay. It's, um, <laughs> thank you to them yeah. for, I, I was so lucky to have a position open up with that team. Um, just a year and a half ago. So I've only been back to NPS a year and a half ago. But the story I begins, I think I landed my role with them because I spent almost seven years in the operations research department teaching. As that a military faculty. As military That's faculty. Right. I was with the team uh, here in Monterey for almost seven years, during which time I, uh, I, I would say that I also did a deployment with the Marines to Iraq as a combat analyst during mm -hmm. my time there. But being, having jobs where I was an analyst both in the Pentagon and with Fifth Fleet and then teaching OR and going to Iraq as a combat analyst, all that added up to this big chunk of my career that I think um, DRMI um, found worthy, maybe they could leverage some of that. And so I like to think of DRMI as an institution mm -hmm. that teaches programming. Right. And by well, programming, by programming, you don't yeah. mean computer programming. Yes, right. not <laughs> pr not computer programming. <laughs> right. So those in, in the Department of Defense and perhaps some other places know that programming is about connecting your strategy to your budget. It's that middle ground. How do you make decisions to spend your money wisely? And for us, the, the money, of course, comes from the U.S. taxpayer. Right. How do we best spend that money, and that's what we teach. It's about resources management, money's a resource, people are resources. You have resources all over the place. We teach that middle ground, that programming. And so as an, as an OR guy, operations research guy, I fit naturally into that because sure, it's because like- because you trade the analysis, of, you trade off of cost benefit and that sort of thing as you can make those connections. Sure. That's exactly the way it is. So the way, um, in, back in 1963-64 during the Kennedy administration, they decided to start something they call PPB E today. By the way, they were flying the SH-2 back then, too. And I think they might have been <laughs> flying the first <laughs> SH-2s. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to get that in, but go ahead. Yes, I think the sea sprites <laughs> were, were actually, uh, <laughs> like, that may have been their first deployment back then during the Kennedy. Now for our audience, they should Google that to see exactly what that airplane looks like. Yes, please look it up. SH-2F <laughs> sea very, sprite. Very small. Yes, so, smaller than what we have today. And less but capable. go ahead. I'm sorry. They, they created the PBE system, which is the process in which we tie that national strategy to our budgeting and, uh, uh, and what we, how we submit to Congress. Exactly. Yes, exactly. And as part of that, um, back in the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, they decided they needed to teach their, their workforce how to do that better. And hence, DRMI was formed. And that's what we've been doing for about the last 54 years. Now, this is a charter, but it's not degreed programs. These are mainly short courses, right? Both Absolutely here resident right. and around the world. So Absolutely. you touch many different countries, including our own. And t let's start with a couple of those courses. You have a course going on now, is that right? We absolutely do. So describe that course a little bit. Yeah, so we, we currently have our senior international defense management course going on. And the senior is the key word there, as well as international. So those are the two key words in this. We have flag officers and gener general officers from around the globe, 30 countries right now. We have 45 flag and general officers in a course honing their skills on how to connect strategy to their budgets in their nations. Mm -hmm. it's, it's absolutely exciting to see to see that. And I will, I will add to you, yes, what we teach at DRMI is valuable, but getting our partners 
and, and these international um, partners that we have around the globe, getting them together, talking to each other, learning together, it's, I, can't, I couldn't put a price on, uh, on that. It no, is, it's can. absolutely priceless. Particularly at that senior level, where they can talk about the challenges and strategies and challenge of emerging uh, threats around the world, both state and non-state threats, uh, how to address those and that sort of thing. And I know your course addresses a lot of that. It, do it does, yeah. and, we, and we look at it like as from, from a three-piece lens, right? We, we have economists, we're, and I would, I would claim world-renowned economists on our team. Absolutely. We have world-renowned operations research people, yours person, uh, me excluded, <laughs> but world-renowned uh, <laughs> OR people on the team, right. and we have uh, financial managers on the team that have managed comptroller-wise, money. They've managed the budget for our DOD at the highest levels. So you take those three pieces and turn that into how do you manage your resources. Now, besides that course, what other courses do you have? Uh, besides the senior uh, flag and general officer course? Yeah, so that course happens once a year. Right. And it's, it's great. We have a core course that's just simply the defense resources management course. It's um, a more detailed version of the senior course. The senior folks stay at a little bit higher level. That's our that's our gold course. This DRMC. It's four weeks, mm -hmm. similar to the to the senior course. But that's that's if you had to describe DRMI, that's our core course. And it's pull that course has as many as fifty students each iteration. We teach it four times a year all these international and U.S. students. So we get many more U.S. students in the DRMC. So now, is this a resident course? It is a resident course. Right. And the two, the two I've talked about so far are resident here right. in Monterey. So we bring those, and, and I'm glad you brought that up, Jeff, because another very incredibly valuable thing that we do is to expose our international friends and partners, these senior leaders and mid-level managers and decision makers. We expose them to all the great things about the West Coast. And, and the Central Coast particularly, and, and right? And, <laughs> and yeah. absolutely about the Central Coast most importantly. So they get, they get a wonderful immersion. Just coming down to the farmer's market on Tuesdays here yeah. in Monterey is, I think that's wor it's almost priceless, some of the things that our international partners get. So yes, those two short courses, we have a 10-week version, which is also resident okay. um, at DRMI. But I think, I think you want to talk about the mobile stuff. Do you right. want to talk well, about well, that? How, we're reach, reach around the world. Sure, we got a couple of minutes left, so go ahead. Yeah, so we also teach mobile courses. So um, when a country sends people to Monterey, they can only usually send one or two, maybe three at the most. We actually launch our professors, these economists and OR people and, and financial managers. We launch our team to different countries where we can teach groups we went to Iraq, I think they had 80 students oh, wow. in one big group. We wow. had guys teaching in Iraq about programming, about sure. connection your, connecting your strategy. We call that a mobile international uh, defense management course. And you go all over the world for that. All over the world. Well, you know, what a lot of people don't realize is <clears throat> when MPS says we touch 60,000 people a year, most of those are not our graduate programs. Most of those are the small programs or the short courses that DRMI touch, that uh, our, uh, our uh, CCMR touches, our uh, executive programs touch. So we have continuing programs all over the place. I think that's perfect, Jeff. That's and, uh, exactly it. I want to thank you very much for sharing uh, what's this team again? Yes, <laughs> the, the, the Browns. Teams. Yes, no. and, and hopefully they'll break their perfect record. Uh, and thank you for sharing your personal. And thank you for being here uh, at Naval Postgraduate School, doing the great work you do. Thank you very much, Jeff. And thank you for uh, joining us for this segment of the Naval Postgraduate School Foundation-sponsored Your Town Television program. Join us again to learn more about what NPS is doing on your peninsula.